Great. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you, uh, organizers, for inviting me. I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit today about uh, some of our work, uh, much like Billy Kim talked about yesterday, using synthetic lethal screens, except instead of using siRNA libraries, we use small molecule libraries. And the idea was that uh, we could interrogate the whole genome to under undercover uh, genetic drivers using this approach, and when we have identified these, then we would already have uh, uh, candidate molecules to inhibit them. So the left-hand side is just a very simplistic cartoon taken from really the work done in yeast where the concept of synthetic lethal is derived from these lower organisms where you have two genes, A and B, that when either one of them individually is lost, there's no effect, but when both of them are lost, you get lethality. So the right-hand side is a cartoon from a review that we wrote several years ago. It was how we did the screen where we mixed uh, renal cancer cells that were genetically matched for VHL, one containing, uh, they contained two different fluorescent markers so that they were internally controlled, and then uh, what the predicted outcomes would be, that the vast majority of these would either have no effect on either cell type or they would kill both cell types or that you would have ones that would specifically kill uh, cells that lack VHL, which we were interested in, or those that would kill the wild type. And just uh, for your interest, we've uh, published uh, a number of these studies right now, so what, uh, some of what I'm going to talk about you could, you could look up if you're interested. So we screened 130,000 small molecules. Again, uh, these were in multiple cell lines that were genetically matched for VHL. And we were looking for a selective killing of, of those cells that lack VHL. So out of this 130,000, we've about, had about 400. From those 400, and we no longer were able to use robotics to do the screens. Instead now, um, a single graduate student took these and arrayed them and did secondary assays to uh, make sure that these actually were what we thought they were. And I will tell you about two of these molecules, uh, one called STF61, which is an autophagy inducer. It's inducing cell death in renal cancer cells by inducing an autophagic process. Second is uh, called STF31 of which we got several candidates that came out, uh, and this inhibits uh, the GLUT1 transporter. And then uh, just, uh, I added this just for, to be complete, is that we have molecules that would selectively kill the VHL wild type cells and have no effect on the null cells, as you might expect, and that's called STF51. So the reason why we, we did this, and I'm sure you're all aware of, is if you looked at uh, renal cancer cells that either lack VHL or her wild-type VHL, and you looked at classical chemotherapeutic agents, what you find is that it kills both cell types. So there's no differential in terms uh, of VHL killing, or it has no effect in either cell type. Instead, what we really want to maximize the ability to get a therapeutic index is to develop small molecules that would selectively kill those cells that lack VHL, and killing here is defined in the black, versus having no effect in those cells that are wild type VHL. And here's several examples uh, from the screen. So here is STF6247. And this is a cell survival curve. This is a log-log based scale. And what you can see here is the wild-type VHL cells are really unaffected by this molecule. And the VHL deficient cells uh, are very potently affected. If you take a, a renal cancer cell that has wild-type VHL and you put an SH for VHL in, you can now sensitize the cell to killing, indicating that this sensitivity is based on VHL. And here's an example, if you actually looked in the wells and looked at increasing concentrations of this drug, you see is that you see a nice dose-dependent increase in cell killing in the VHL deficient, whereas in the VHL wild type, there's no effect. So very interestingly, though, this molecule, uh, toxicity is HIF independent. So either by inhibiting HIF or by uh, conditionally expressing a, a, a non-degradable HIF molecule, you can see that in either case, you're not changing the sensitivity. 
Okay, and then the bottom here is the appropriate controls to, to demonstrate that we're getting uh, the effects that we, we thought. But instead, what's killing the cell appears to be uh, an autophagic type cell death. So these are electron uh, micrographs. Uh, this is vehicle treated. This is the six series treated. You can see the formation of these double membranes, a classical feature of, of autophagy. And then in the VHL deficient cells, we saw this pattern a great deal. We saw the formation of lysosomes in acidic vesicles, and we never really saw the fusion of the two. So if we look now at a series of analogs, so kind of, in this case, trying to do almost kind of like a chemical genetic uh, uh, derivative screen to prove this point, is that here's a series of analogs. They're all inducing autophagy to some degree as detected by uh, uh, LC3, the myosin light chain, lipidated form. And you can see here's FDS 62247, which has a 25-fold differential between VHL wild type and deficient uh, cells. And you can see there's this very large increase in the amount of these acidic organelles. And if you look at other molecules here that are also quite potent in terms of, of, of killing, so for example, uh, this one here is about 20-fold, you can see that it also is very potent. Whereas those that are not inducing any autophagy or have minor effects on autophagy, you're not seeing any increase in this formation of uh, acidic vesicles. So the way we think this works is that 6247 uh, interferes with ER Golgi trafficking. And that we found a series of genes that are VHL regulated, which are involved in this process. And that this then sits, initiates an autophagic process. And this autophagic process occurs both in VHL wild type and VHL null cells. But the difference is, is that in the VHL deficient cells, you're not getting this efficient fusion of these acidic vesicles with the lysosomes. And this is resulting in cell death, whereas in the VHL wild types, you have cell survival. So the second molecule is this STF31. So this is uh, looking at uh, a colony forming ability, and you can see here in VHL deficient cells, you're able to wipe out these colonies, and these colonies are dying by a, a necrotic form of cell death. So if we look at changes uh, in glucose uptake, here's the VHL wild type cells, and you can see that there's really no change with increasing concentration of drug, whereas the VHL deficient, there's a very precipitous drop uh, with drug concentration. If you look at ATP levels, which follows this decrease in glucose, ATP levels go down. And if you look at clonogenic survival, you see that also decreases. Again, a log-log based scale. Whereas the VHL wild type cells are uh, not affected. So GLUT1 belongs to the solute carrier 2A transporter family. Um, it's a, 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 an aqueous tunnel within a cell membrane. Uh, it uh, uh, binds directly to GLUT1, this STF31, and we have no interactions, uh, interactions with other GLUTs that we could detect, either detecting this by affinity chromatography, differential expression assays, uh, or uh, genetically matched uh, GLUT1 cells. So what's the downside of, of GLUT1 inhibitor? And that downside would be is normal tissue tox, but in fact, if you actually look at normal tissues, the largest cell type that expresses GLUT1 are erythrocytes. So here we're looking at human and mouse. Human erythrocytes actually utilize GLUT1, mouse utilizes GLUT3. And each one of these panels, there's either red blood cells or mouse RBCs. The left both panel here is uh, red blood cells incubated with STF31. The middle is the vehicle, and the right is uh, a uh, RBC lysis buffer. And what you can see here is that there was no effect, uh, at least in terms of three days, if not even longer, in terms of RBC effect. So RBCs, while they have high levels of, of uh, GLUT1, and GLUT1 is inhibited in these RBCs, that's not inducing cell lysis. What about uh, other tumor types as well as renal cell cancer? So on the right-hand side, we're looking at GLUT1 expression. And at the RNA level, is that there's been several reports saying that the messenger RNA is very high. But in fact, as everybody in this room knows, very rarely do you ever use uh, PET CT scanning really in staging for renal cell cancer, uh, maybe for metastatic disease, but never really rarely for primary. 
So if you look, though, at uh, renal cell cancer uh, in terms of GLUT1 expression, what you see is that about 40% of these, of these tumors have significant levels of GLUT1 at the protein level. Okay? So what about in vivo? This is a the molecule unoptimized from the screen. This is a, a PET-CT slice. Here is very high glucose uptake of the tumor is that uh, after three treatments, three daily treatments of uh, STF-31, you see that this tumor is significantly decreased in terms of its uh, uh, FDG uptake. And in, in addition, there's an increase in its necrotic core. Here's seven mice demonstrating the decrease in glucose uptake in all the seven mice. And here's looking at tumor growth delay. Here is the vehicle-treated tumors. And here is the GLUT1 inhibitor-treated tumors. So there is significant efficacy even with our HIT, let alone the optimized molecule. So the way we think this works is that in cells that have wild-type VHL, they're not dependent on GLUT1 uh, for their glucose uptake and uh, are able to uh, perform uh, both glycolysis and a TCA cycle. Cells that lack VHL is that GLUT1 levels uh, are uh, elevated. They're highly dependent upon GLUT1. And in addition, they have uh, uh, increased expression of a, a kinase called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which uh, prevents pyruvate ultimately from going to acetyl-CoA. And therefore, since they're not really very efficient at performing TCA cycle and their me metabolic requirements are more dependent on glycolysis, they're dying. So I'm going to uh, end by just telling you the uh, uh, newest gene that we think is, is a, a potentially very uh, good target uh, for real cell cancer. is one called uh, NOL3 or ARC. And this is a gene that contains something called a CAR domain, which is a caspase activating and recruitment domain. And this gene, ARC, it is, inhibits both the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathways of apoptosis. So extrinsic, meaning those induced by death ligands, such as FAST or TNF, or the intrinsic, where apoptosis is being signaled uh, in the, uh, from the uh, mitochondria through cytochrome C release. So it's inhibiting both pathways. So here's data to show you that ARC is induced by hypoxia. These are khaki one cells. And as a reference, here's uh, 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 phosphoglucokinase. Here is a variety of different cell types. There's lung cancer, mel uh, melanoma, uh, cervical, renal cancers. Uh, and you can see that in all these cases, uh, ARC is very nicely induced by hypoxia. So this ARC induction, to our surprise, was turned out to be uh, HIF-1 dependent versus HIF-2 dependent. So here we're looking at hypoxia induction. Here's SH to HIF-1-alpha and SH to HIF-2-alpha. If you knock out HIF-1-alpha, you can see you've abolished the induction of ARC under hypoxic conditions, whereas with HIF-2-alpha, there's no effect. If you use genetically matched cells that have HIF-1-alpha deleted from the genome, again, you see there's no induction of ARC. If you overexpress a HIF-1-alpha or HIF-2-alpha constitutively uh, active molecule, you can see that HIF-1-alpha is very potently able to induce ARC and HIF-2-alpha uh, not so much. We identified the uh, binding site in the ARC promoter that's uh, uh, binding the HIF molecule. And very interesting enough is that this is a alteration that occurs uh, of both the onset of, uh, of, of mammals, because as you see here, when you go from the marmoset to the lemur, uh, the, this uh, HRE is lost. So when you look at mouse and rat, you don't see this induction. So ARC expression is elevated in human renal cell cancer. Here's normal kidney and clear cell renal cell cancer. All four of these panels demonstrate that point. Panel E here shows that ARC and CA9, a marker for uh, HIF activity, co-localized very nicely. And on the right is actual quantification of that co-localization, demonstrating that both ARC and CA9 uh, are very uh, coincidental in terms of their expression. What happens if you knock down ARC? So here uh, is uh, under normoxy conditions. Here's the uh, change in cell number. If you knock down ARC, what you see here is that inhibition of growth under 
normoxy conditions, as well as an inhibition of growth and, if not, cell lethality under hypoxic conditions. Here's looking at colony forming ability, same thing. And, and what's happening is that these cells are dying by apoptosis, as evidenced here by the activation of the cleave caspase 3. So most importantly, and getting back to my initial comments, is that here are multiple VHL cell lines, RCC4 and RCC10, genetically matched for VHL. Knocking down ARC alone in these cells is a very potent effect, has a very potent effect on cell survival. And in addition, it takes these cells and makes them now extremely sensitive to chemotherapeutic agents such as cisplatinum. If you try to grow tumors in which ARC is stably knocked down, they do not grow very well, if at all. So the way this works is that uh, in cells that uh, have a wild-type VHL, ARC has uh, at low levels and has very little inhibitory effect in terms of caspase activity. But in cells in which VHL is lost, and probably this is an early event with the initial loss of VHL, and both HIF-1 and HIF-2 are still present in renal cell cancers, is that ARC levels goes up and inhibits both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. So most important slide, Patrick Suffin, Denise Chan, and Sandra Turka were responsible for this, the studies in the synthetic lethal screens, and Olga Razaranova and uh, Olga and uh, Lara Castellini responsible for the studies with ARC. Thank you very much.